and and this plan. Also, yeah. Okay. Okay. So now the recording should be on, and uh, I think we can start. So. Uh, hello everyone. So once again, thank you very much for uh, coming to this uh, new format of PhD Defenses, uh, which now mostly are uh, uh, online after the pandemic. And uh, I want to uh, say a warm thanks to the PhD jury, composed of Jan Sola, uh, uh, Benalog Nebi, and Olivia Stas, and uh, uh, for attending the PhD uh, defense of uh, Mr. Prashant Tamados. That in the next 40 45 minutes, uh, we present these results obtained over uh, the over the last three years. So I leave the stage to Mr. Prashant Ramados for his uh, presentation. And uh, once again, thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Daniele, for the introduction. I'll start by sharing the screen. So. I hope uh, you can all see the screen. OK, uh, hello everyone. I'm Prashant Ramados. I would firstly like to thank uh, the committee members, friends, family and colleagues who are present here. For the next 40 minutes, I'll be presenting as to why estimator design on matrix Lie groups can be beneficial when applied to state estimation for human motion and humanoid locomotion. So what is the big picture and why should we be interested in this research? I motivate this with two high level questions. The first question is, how can we achieve human level performances on humanoid robots? Well, such agile and highly dynamic motions come very naturally to humans, but it is rather very challenging for humanoid robots. On the other hand, the second question is, how can we help the working conditions for human workers? Even on a modern day shop floor, uh, it still requires labor intensive jobs and human factors require the elements of safety and ergonomics, which not when accounted for uh, leads to health issues such as musculoskeletal disorders. So combining the two questions we ask, uh, can humanoid robots help the human workers of the future? One possible answer to this question is yes, using human humanoid collaboration. One of the outcomes of DORPA robotics challenge in 2013 was a hierarchical architecture for the control of humanoid robots, where high level objectives from a given task was given to a trajectory optimization layer. Meanwhile, measurements coming from the robot are passed on to a state estimation block, which are then used to generate reference trajectories for a control layer. The whole body control layer then ge generates joint commands for executing the necessary motions on the robot. Control of humanoid robots is a challenging task, and adding a human into the loop makes it even more complex. So it is crucial to envision a unified control architecture for both human humanoid collaboration. What we do here is we take the robot control architecture and we extend it towards a human behavioral architecture. Now measurements coming from the distributed sensors worn by the human uh, or the variable sensing technologies is pa passed on to a state estimation block in a human behavioral architecture that infers the human state. This human state, along with some high level objectives from the collaborative task, is then used in the robot control architecture to generate joint commands for the robot that will help improve the quality of task for the human. Additionally, if the human is wearing an exoskeleton, we can also generate assistive torques for the human to help him during the task. My PSD thesis focused mainly on the state estimation blocks for robot control architecture and human behavioral architecture. In particular, the focus was on the estimation of kinematic state of floating based multibody systems through a sensor fusion of multiple distributed high frequency measurements using a proper representation for the underlying geometry of state and measurements. Overall, we provide a unified approach for state estimation of humans and robots using Lie groups. There are three contributions to the thesis. The first one is a loosely coupled sensor fusion for floating based estimation of humanoid robot. The second one is a tightly coupled sensor fusion, again for the floating based estimation of humanoid robot. And finally, we, I present full body human kinematics estimation. As an overview for the remainder of this presentation, I'll first go through the background, then present the contributions for the estimation for the robots. Then I present the whole body human kinematics estimation followed by conclusions and future directions. The experiments conducted within the scope of this thesis were basically on two robotic platforms 
which is ICUP 2.5 and ICUP 3.0. These are child and teen sized humanoid robots, each with 32 degrees of freedom across the neck, torso, arms, and legs. And they are equipped with distributed inertial and force stock sensing technologies that enable whole body dynamics, estimation, and control. For what concerns the human agents, we relied on two motion tracking systems. The first one was a commercially available XN suit that consists of 17 inertial sensors distributed across the uh, body of the human for whole body human motion construction. And the second one was a wearable sensing technology as a part of IFEED tech here at Italian Institute of Technology, which consists of a full body suit consisting of 10 inertial sensors and four stock sensorized shoes, which measure ground reaction wrenches at the feet. Here, I must, it must be noted that the estimation algorithms developed for the human work independently of the motion tracking uh, systems used. For modeling the humans and robots, we use a unified representation using rigid body systems framework, and we model them as floating based multi-body systems with high number of degrees of freedom, and each degree of freedom is modeled as a revolute joint. Here, the floating base implies that these agents are not fixed to their environment and they are freely moving. This means that in addition to the in addition to tracking the joint configuration of or shape of these uh, agents, we also need to track an additional six degrees of freedom that represent the position and orientation or force of the human or human or robot in a given space. So the, this is represented by the homogeneous transformation H and which along with the joint positions S can give us the full kinematic configuration of the uh, human or the robot. Similarly, for the system velocity, we include a six dimensional velocity of the base along with the joint velocities. The contributions of this th uh, thesis are based on the theory of matrix Lie groups. So here I give a very quick glance at the important operators of the Lie group. I start, we can start with the Lie group G, which is a smooth object, uh, which means that we can take derivatives at any points on this object. And tangents, tangents at these points are generally called as tangent spaces, which are linear spaces. And especially the tangent spaces at the identity element of the Lie group is called the Lie algebra denoted by small g. This Lie algebra is associated with a vector space. And we can move, move uh, back and forth between the vector space and the Lie algebra using hat and V operators. Similarly, we can move back and forth between the Lie algebra and the Lie group using exponential and logarithmic operators. And another important operator is an adjoint map that transfers elements from one tangent space to the Lie algebra or vice versa. Some of the important matrix Lie groups that we de use day to day day to day in our lives as roboticists are group of rotations and group of rigid body transformations where P denotes the position of the uh, rigid body and R the rotation of the rigid body. And it can also be extended towards a group of extended forces where in, we include uh, the linear velocity of the rigid body within the same matrix representation. So for defining estimators on Lie group, we need to define a notion of error and uh, the error on matrix Lie groups are given by matrix multiplication and matrix inversion. And here, according to the order of multiplication, I classify the errors as left and right invariant errors of type one and type two. Why these errors are called as invariant errors are due to their invariance to the left and right translation. If we take a system and transform it using a left or right translation, then the error of the transform system is uh, same as the original system. And another important property for the uh, invariant error is the log linear dynamics. What this property says is the evolution of the nonlinear error on the group manifold can be captured exactly by a linear system evolving in the Lie algebra. Uncertainty on matrix Lie groups is defined with the notion of concentrated Gaussian distribution, which means that mean is defined on the Lie group and the covariance is defined on the Lie algebra. Now I move on to the first contribution, loosely coupled sense fusion for floating base estimation of humanoid robot. Here, the question we ask is, can we decouple nonlinear estimation of base rotation from linear position and velocity terms? Can this decoupling approach also in terms of measurement, uh, different multimodal measurement sources, uh, be provide estimates that are comparable to fully coupled inference approaches such as EKF? So some works in the past have been asking the same question. Here, a uh, dead reckoning uh, for bipedal robots computes, computes base force using kinematics-based legged odometry, and then they use axiometer measurements for position and velocity corrections. 
Further, they also use ground reaction wrenches for correcting position errors that might occur due to foot rotations. A simple estimation approach was proposed where uh, an, an orientation is estimated using a nonlinear uh, observer uh, through IMU measurements, and this is combined with orientation estimates coming from the kinematics in the oil, space of Euler angles. Su such decoupling approaches have also been used in quadrupeds where the uh, the, the decoupling is exploited to replace an off-the-shelf nonlinear observer with, with improved uh, uh, estimation methods for the orientation. In the, along the same line, we propose a, for, towards the development of simple weighted averaging estimator for base orientation and velocity estimation, with the focus mainly on the question of how to properly average in the space of rotations and its extension towards force averaging. So we begin with legged odometry, which is a common method for prop propagating the base state using kinematics and contacts, assuming that at least one link is in contact with the environment at all times. At initial time, we assume that we know uh, the foot is in uh, contact and we know the force of the foot with respect to an inertial frame A. And uh, using this information and the relative kinematics, we can compute the base force. And as the robot moves, the foot is, uh, remains fixed and the base force is constantly updated. And as soon as a new contact is made, the uh, fixed frame is changed from the old foot to new foot and the relevant transformation quantities are uh, updated so that the kinematics of uh, the base force is updated uh, according to the relative kinematics of the new foot in contact. So this is extended towards a simple weighted averaging uh, where here, uh, if you see the block diagram from left to right, we begin with the IMU measurements, which are passed through the attitude observer to get a base orientation estimate. And similarly, uh, contacts and encoders information are passed through legged odometry to get kinematics base, base estimate. These are then fused within a weighted rotation averaging block to get a fused orientation estimate. And for, for the velocity averaging, we use the angular velocity uh, from the gyroscope that is rigidly mounted onto the base link of the robot and uh, joint velocities measured by the encoders. And uh, since we know that uh, the foot is in, at least one foot is in contact with the environment at all times, we impose a, impose a rigid contact constraint of this foot and use the zero uh, velocity of the foot for averaging. For the rotation averaging is, uh, is done in the space of SO3. We use a notion of Karcher mean, which computes the center of mass of elements on the group manifold. This is done by minimizing a distance function between points on the group manifold, and the distance function is given by the norm of the logarithm of the rotation error. The minimization uh, becomes a Riemannian gradient descent, and here we, we see 100 samples of a perturb, perturb rotation, and the mean uh, is given by thin long axis on the left, and the output of uh, the rotation averaging here is seen on the right, which resembles the mean uh, rotation. It must be noted that this averaging approach extends in a straightforward, straightforward manner towards force averaging because it uh, relies on the theory of matrix levels. For velocity averaging, as mentioned earlier, we stack all of the measurements into a system of linear equations, y equals ax, where the matrix A is composed of Jacobians and a selection matrix. And the system of linear equations are solved using a regularized weighted pseudo inverse. Sometimes when the robot is uh, subjected to external perturbations, the rigid contact constraint is invalidated and the null foot velocity uh, uh, is not valid anymore. The uh, assumption is not valid anymore. So we also propose a relaxation on the null foot velocity using measurements coming from the gyroscope mounted on the foot of the robot along with contact wrenches. Here we uh, see a simulation of a position control robot in a gazebo environment and uh, the robot is subject to external perturbations uh, in such a way that it rotates and uh, it moves in place, causing the foot to rotate. Here on the left, we, uh, we see a comparison of uh, vanilla legged odometry uh, estimates of base orientation coming from legged odometry in red, and in comparison with the weighted averaging approach that we proposed in uh, blue, along with the black line that uh, gives the uh, ground truth from the gazebo simulator. It can be seen that such, a low, uh, such uh, perturbations induces low resolution changes in the orientation, and only with the fusion of an IMU, we are able to capture these low resolution uh, changes. 
Here in this uh, slide, I want to highlight the difference of averaging over Euler angles and averaging over Lie groups. Here, the robot is made to uh, fall backwards in such a way that one of the uh, orientation axis, that is the roll axis, wraps around uh, uh, from minus 180 de degrees to 180 degrees, which when used for the computation of the uh, base orientation uh, through the fusion, proposed fusion, results in discontinuities in the uh, resulting estimate. Instead, uh, averaging on SO3 avoids this sort of discontinuities. It must be noted that such discontinuities when passed back as feedback to the controller makes the controller to stop working. I move on to the uh, contribution of uh, tight, uh, second contribution, which is the tightly coupled sensor fusion for floating base estimation of humanoid robot. And uh, the comparison with the previous contribution is done in this section. So here, what we ask is, can tightly coupled sensor fusion provide estimates of higher accuracy? We have a measurement set of uh, encoders, IMU, and contacts, and we want to combine all of them together in a single algorithm to estimate the base force and linear velocity, along with feed forces, and uh, we also want to additionally estimate the biases of the IMU. So a, a common approach used for legged robot state estimation is uh, based on extended Kalman filter, which uses a strapped-on IMU uh, model for uh, the system dynamics and relative kinematics for as a measurement model. A point foot filter was proposed in which a base state was augmented with foot positions within the state to improve, uh, uh, to achieve improved accuracy on the base uh, state estimates. This point foot filter was extended towards a flat foot scenario of uh, the humanoid robot where the base state was augmented also with foot rotations. And uh, this flat foot filter showed an improved accuracy in comparison with the point foot filter when applied to humanoid robots. It must be noted that for these filters, the state representation uh, was based on a quaternion representation for the uh, ro rotations and uh, Euclidean vectors for the positions. More recently, uh, uh, an, an another approach called the invariant EKF was proposed. Uh, essentially, it used the same EKF structure as we see in the left, but it only varied in the state representation where they used matrix Lie groups for the state representation and vector observations. Uh, but this filter showed improved uh, uh, performances in comparison with the quaternion based filters. A similar extension was done to the humanoid uh, robot case. And uh, what we pro propose is, uh, in comparison with the existing uh, estimators, we use a state representation and also a uh, measurement representation evolving on matrix Lie groups. So here, we propose a development of flat foot filter for humanoid based estimate estimation, considering evolution of both state and measurements on distinct matrix Lie groups. And we also perform a comparison of estimated design based on the choice of error, state, and system dynamics representation. I want to recall uh, on the extended Kalman filter theory. Here, uh, we begin with a discrete dynamical system where system dynamics F is used to predict the state at uh, uh, time instant K plus one given the current state and control input ve uh, vector U. This can be assumed to be affected by additive white Gaussian noise W. We have vector measurements Z, which can be expressed uh, using a measurement model H as a function of state and is assumed to be affected by additive white Gaussian noise N. So the extended Kalman filter consists of two steps, a prediction step and an update step. In the prediction step, the state is propagated using a nonlinear function f, and while the covariance is propagated using a linearized system matrix f and the noise covariance q. During the up update step, an innovation is computed from the actual measurement and uh, the uh, measurement model, like expected measurement, that uses uh, the predicted state estimate as a, uh, input to the measurement model. And this innovation is used to compute a state correction, which is then added to the predicted state estimate to compute an updated state estimate. Similarly, the covariance is updated using the linearized measurement model and the Kalman gain. So when we general, when we want to generalize the EKF on vector space to matrix Lie groups, what we notice is that the state now is evolving over Lie groups G, and the system dynamics is given by a motion model omega here on the left which is expressed in the vector space associated to the Lie algebra of the Lie group G. This is assumed to be affected again by additive white Gaussian noise, but expressed in the vector space, which then make, becomes multiplicative noise when expressed in the Lie group. 
The measurements again are evolving over Lie groups G prime and are affected by noise n in the vector space associated to the Lie algebra of G prime. The EKF structure remains the same because this is a generalization of a vector spaces. However, now the state is pro uh, propagated uh, and updated using the exponential map and matrix multiplication. Instead, for the uh, difference of uh, computation for the innovation term, we rely on matrix inversion on the logarithmic map. So we propose diligent KIO, which stands for discrete Lie group extended Kalman filter for kinematic inertial odometry, where we want to estimate the base uh, state, which consists of base rotation R, position P, and velocity V expressed as a group of uh, extended base poses. And we also want to es estimate the foot poses, which are expressed as a group of rigid body transformations, while the IMU biases affecting the IMU measurements are expressed as a group of translations. Recalling the assumptions uh, that the IMU is rigidly attached to the base link of the robot and at least one foot is in contact at any time instant, a reduced motion mod reduced model can be used as a motion model, which relies on the strap down inertial model that computes uh, the base, base post evolution using motion increments coming from uh, the gyroscope and accelerometer measurements. For the evolution of the feet foot post, we assume that they remain fixed and we uh, this imposes a null foot velocity uh, affected by additive white caution noises. But it must be noted that this uh, prediction model becomes invalid during the swing phase uh, of the foot. So at this case, what we do is we dynamically scale the covariances to very high values to stop trusting this prediction model and rely only on the measurements for the update of the foot poses. We assume that the IMU biases are affected by slowly varying dynamics and we assume zero velocities for the motion model affected by additive uh, white caution noise again. For the measurements for the uh, diligent KIO, we fall back to the classical relative base to foot kinematics, but now the measurements are expressed as to be evolving over a group of rigid body transformations. And during double support, we stack two SE3 objects together uh, to get the pose, uh, relative poses of both the feet with respect to the base. Filter formulation depends on the choice of error, and we use a left invariant error for uh, deriving the filter or diligent KIO. The log linear dynamics is uh, used to compute the linearized error dynamics and innovation updates for the filter. Here we show an experiment uh, on uh, ICUB uh, 2.5 humanoid robot for a position controlled uh, walking where uh, the uh, robot is walking for one meter in a forward direction. On the left, we compare four different filters, two of which are flat foot filters, OCEKF in yellow, diligent KIO in green, which is the proposed filter while invariant EKF in red is a point foot filter, and SWA is the contribution that we proposed with the loosely coupled sensor fusion approach. From the uh, graph, what we can notice is that the filters that use the state representation of matrix Lie groups have really low errors in the directions of rotation, while in the direction of velocity, the errors for the EKF or uh, EKF based approaches are quite low when compared to the loosely coupled sensor fusion approaches. It must be noted that the position drifts uh, in the estimates, uh, the estimate and drifts in estimated positions is inevitable for while walking due to imprecise contact timings and uh, uh, potential kinematic modeling errors. However, uh, more than that, for EKF based approaches, the position drifts might occur also due to wrong uh, choice of linearization points. Here, uh, looking at the errors re related to the position, you can see that SWA does not uh, suffer from the least position errors because it does not uh, uh, go through any linearization, while invariant TKF also suffers from low position errors because the error evolution for invariant TKF does not depend on the choice of linearization points. While the OCEKF and diligent KIO have an error system that, dep that is uh, dependent on the uh, straight trajectory. So here uh, in this slide, what we show is a comparison of uh, a quaternion based approach with a matrix Lie group based approach. And what we do is along the observable directions of position, uh, sorry, orientation and velocity, uh, we perturb these observable directions uh, in the, in, as the, we randomize the initial states 
and we uh, verify for fast convergence and convergence to the true state. It can be noticed that diligent KIO, which, is, which, which uses a matrix Lie group representation, converges faster and towards the true state in all, almost all the directions. So uh, in order to handle the problems related to the linearization points, I asked two questions here. What happens if we consider a different choice of error? And what happens if we start from continuous system dynamics and then discretize it? These questions are asked to move towards the uh, invariant TKF, which shows to have uh, an important properties, which I will discuss now. So the invariant TKF starts with continuous system dynamics. And uh, if the system dynamics has this property of being group affine, then the error evolution for this uh, system dynamics is independent of the state trajectory. This means that the error evolution does not depend on the linearization points. And the invariant TKF also exploits the structure of matrix Lie group to propose what is called as invariant observations, which results in measurement model Jacobians that are independent of the state trajectory. These two properties together are key properties for building consistent state estimators. So coming back to the two questions that I asked, trying to move towards the uh, framework of invariant filtering, I, uh, we derive uh, some variance of the uh, original filter diligent KIO. And here, what, what should be noticed is that the filter that uh, does the diligent, sorry, discrete counterparts of the filter that does not use any of the properties of the invariant filter has an error system that is state dependent, while the continuous discrete counterparts that exploit at least uh, an invariant error propagation uh, enjoy some of the properties of the invariant filtering. In particular, what we noticed was for the left invariant, when we use left invariant error, although the uh, linearized system or the er linear error system becomes independent of the state trajectory, it depends on the IMU measurements. While uh, if we choose the right invariant error, uh, bes besides from becoming state independent, the error system also becomes time invariant. Here we show a comparison of uh, all the estimators for a walking experiment conducted on ICUP 3 humanoid robot in simulation where the robot is walking for three meters. Can be seen that the position drifts are inevitable, but the position drifts remain very small for the uh, filters that exploit some or all of the properties of invariant filtering framework, which we can see in the bottom uh, right. So here we look at the uh, spider plots for the previous experiment, uh, comparing uh, the error metrics. Sorry, I forgot to mention earlier, what we do here is we use uh, the error metrics of absolute trajectory error, which actually uh, used for comparing the overall performance of the estimator and uh, relative position error is post error is used to compare the drifts in the estimator. So here what we notice is that uh, gen in general matrix filters evolve using uh, matrix Lie group representation suffer from again suffer from low uh, rotation errors in comparison with the quaternion approach. And the most important point here to notice is that the filters that exploit some or all of the properties of the invariant filtering framework suffer from really low position errors, while the other uh, variants of diligent KIO suffer from unacceptable position errors as they walk due to wrong choice of linearization points. Now I move on to the final contribution, which is whole body human kinematics estimation. Here the question we ask is how to reconstruct full body human motion for time critical applications in the absence of position sensors. In particular, we want to combine measurements from distributed IMUs on the human body, worn by the human, and uh, uh, four stock sensors at the feet, and we want to estimate the joint state and the base state of the human. So a Lie group Kalman filter was proposed in the past for uh, full body human motion estimation, but it relied on marker positions. A sparse inertial uh, poser was uh, uh, proposed to use reduced number of IMUs worn by the human for full body human estimation solved using a nonlinear optimization problem. And a constrained EKF on Lie groups again was proposed for a lower limb kinematics estimation. And more recently, uh, a dynamical inverse kinematics approach was proposed for 
full body human motion and estimation that was applicable to models with very large number of degrees of freedoms and for time critical applications. However, the dynamical inverse kinematics in the absence of uh, position sensors does not recover the base state completely. So as a technical contribution, we propose to cascade the dynamical inverse kinematics for joint state estimation with a center of pressure based contact detection and floating base estimation relying on measurements coming from distributed IMUs and post stock sensor issues. It must be noted that the float proposed base estimation algorithm is a contact aware Kalman filter accounting for left invariant, right invariant and non invariant observations. Here, looking at the overall uh, system architecture, we noticed that there are three main blocks for this uh, pipeline, uh, which are the dynamical inverse kinematics, center of pressure based uh, contact detector, and floating base estimator. Here, uh, the target measurements from the distributed IMUs are passed on to the dynamical inverse kinematics block to estimate the joint positions S and joint velocities S dot of the human. Meanwhile, contact trends from the sensor issues are passed to a center of pressure based contact detector to infer contact states of candidate points on the foot, chosen points on the foot. And all of these information are then sent to the floating base estimator to estimate the base state of the human. Taking a de deeper look into the dynamical inverse kinematics, we start with a residual vector which computes the distance between expected rotations of each of the links coming from the forward kinematics along with uh, rotations measured by the IMUs and this uh, error vector or the residual vector is then corrected using measurements from the angular velocity uh, measurements of angular velocities coming from the IMU sensors to compute a corrected target velocity vector. This corrected target velocity vector can be seen as a control input system that drives the forward kinematics towards the available target measurements. The corrected target velocity vector is then sent to the inverse differential kinematics block to solve for a system velocity, which is then integrated to get a system configuration. For the contact detection, the idea is to choose candidate points on the foot that will be in contact with the environment and decompose the contact trench acting on the foot and that is measured by the sensor issues as contact normal forces acting on these points. Then apply a thresholding on these forces to infer the contact state of these points. To choose the uh, candidate points on the foot, what we do is we approximate the foot to have a rectangular geometry and the vertices of the rectangle are chosen as the contact points. For uh, the decomposition of the contact uh, wrench into the normal forces acting on the vertices, we rely on the information of local center of pressure. For the floating base estimation, we use a contact tower external Kalman filter on Lie groups, and in particular, we use a state representation that includes the external base pose along with the position of the uh, contact points on the foot. We also want to estimate the angular velocity of the base link along with the rotations of the foot. We rely on a continuous system dynamics and we use a null acceleration model for the evolution of the base and null velocity model for the evolution of the foot force. And it must be noted that this does not obey group affine dynamics. We use a right invariant error for the filter formulation. And since the system dynamics is not group affine, the error evolution is not independent of state trajectory. For measurements, we employ right invariant, left invariant, and non invariant observations. As a part of right invariant observations, which has the following structure that we see in the equation, we use relative measurements of the candidate contact points with respect to the base link. Then we use the base velocity computed with the assumption uh, of uh, null velocity imposed by the points in contact with the environment. For a left invariant observation, we use angular velocities measured by gyroscope that is assumed to be rigidly attached to the base link of the human. And as non invariant observations, which are evolving over matrix Lie groups, we use the orientation of the foot relative to the base. And in order to make this uh, filter contact aware, what we do is we use terrain height updates from a known elevation map, whenever, uh, which whenever we infer a point on the foot to be in contact with the environment. 
when all of these points are in contact with the environment we also incorporate a contact plane orientation update that uh, corrects for the put rotations must be noted that the right invariant and the left invariant observations lead to innovation updates that are independent of the state trajectory we first perform uh, the validation of the proposed estimator on a uh, robot experiment where the robot is walking backward here the target measurements are simulated from uh, the vicon based ground truth trajectory of the base pose and uh, encoder measurements uh, for the joint positions the inverse differential kinematics within the dynamical inverse kinematics block is solved using a weighted pseudo inverse with uniform weights here in the bottom we can see the reconstruction of joint velocities and joint positions estimated by the dynamical inverse kinematics in, compo in comparison with the encoder measurements for the hip joint in this slide we notice the reconstruction of the base velocity by, by the contact of our ekf and we see uh, uh, in black uh, the uh, the vicon measurement based ground truth velocity it was observed that the kinematic reconstruction with weighted pseudo inverse suffers from high norm estimates in the joint velocities which then are uh, propagated into the boy, uh, base velocity computations we move on to uh, human motion experiments here on the left uh, what we see is a human performing in place motion walking oh, sorry in place walking motion and on the left the human is wearing an xn suit and the force measurements are coming from amti force platforms on the right we have uh, the human wearing i feel suit and i feel sensorized shoes uh, we also compare uh, approaches that use weighted pseudo inverse for uh, the inverse differential kinematics on the left and on the right we have a quadratic programming based solution uh, imposing uh, joint limits for the uh, human model as custom constraints a general observation here that was uh, noticed was that using uh, quadratic programming and enforcing joint limits resulted in more physically feasible motions for the human motion reconstruction in comparison with the weighted pseudo inverse approach here uh, we uh, show a comparison of the proposed estimator with a baseline alg uh, algorithm the baseline algorithm does not use a contact aware ekf or a center of pressure based contact detection and what it does is it imposes a legged odometry directly into the dynamical inverse kinematics as a target measurement it can be seen that the baseline algorithm suffers from position drift while the proposed estimator uh, tracks the base pose effectively we also test the proposed estimation method for a walking experiment to conclude the contributions of this thesis uh, we proposed estimation algorithms for uh, kinematic state of uh, floating based multibody systems such as humans and robots through a sensor fusion of measurements coming from distributed inertial sensors and force stock sensors using representation of uh, uh, matrix lie groups and this gave us a unified state estimation approach for humans and robots in particular for the floating base estimation for humanoid robots a loosely coupled fusion on lie groups was provided uh, provides simple yet effective inference while filtering on lie groups provide higher accuracy and faster convergence and in particular invariant filtering shows a promising road map towards a consistent estimated design for floating base estimation of humanoid robots for what concerns the whole body human kinematics estimation we showed a full body uh kinematics estimation in the absence of position sensors and in particular this algorithm worked independently of the motion tracking system used and worked both on the robots and humans so coming back to the original question that was posed uh, can humanoid robots help the human workers of the future are we there yet i would say we are not far but the estimation strategies proposed in this thesis are not enough so as future directions i propose that the uh, strategies proposed in this thesis can be improved to be more contact aware by including improved contact inference strategies and terrain mapping capabilities 
while this low level framework can become a part of a even bigger hierarchy which combines uh, perception and uh, centroidal state estimation within a single uh, factor factor graph based optimization framework and this can give us a full flesh state estimation framework for human humanoid collaboration and this concludes my presentation and i'm open now for questions yeah thank you uh, very much uh, mr prashant ramados for the presentation at this point uh, we can start the question times i will start uh, uh, with the uh, PhD uh, thesis reviewers. Um, so if uh, uh, um, maybe Stephen Lando may start the alphabetical order. So we open the question time. So uh, for me, uh, for me, sorry, I didn't hear very well. Ah, OK, so we just opened the question times. And yeah, 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 that I could hear. So it's my, my turn to ask the question. OK. Uh, okay, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, yeah, it's interesting to uh, see it presented uh, uh, a little bit differently from the uh, manuscript, and uh, it's uh, it's nice to see also uh, animations and uh, the the work uh, uh, performing like on a real platform. So it's uh, uh, that's enjoyable. Thank you very much. Uh, I enjoyed also, of course, reading a lot of the manuscript. I think it's uh, of uh, nice quality, especially really uh, technically uh, sound. And uh, uh, I do understand how much uh, involvement you had to do, like uh, before you start to uh, produce uh, uh, like uh, new uh, things, especially in, in this field where uh, many things have been done already, but it's still definitely not an, uh, uh, a solved uh, problem or uh, it's not a closed issue. So yeah, thank you uh, for, for that. And I also acknowledge the amount of work that is needed to perform uh, experiments and measurements on humans. That's really time consuming and uh, really hard to report. Like the, it's really hard to report the, the amount of work on, uh, on uh, the manuscript or the publications, but it's, uh, uh, I mean, I, I, I know from experience how hard it is, so I, I, I wish to congratulate you. Uh, of course, I have uh, I have questions. Uh, mostly to have your opinion sometimes and sometimes to have more clarifications. Uh, for example, uh, I see that you use uh, often the, uh, the drift to estimate. Uh, oh, sorry, that's the bell of uh, <laughs> Uh, AISD, so uh, it's, it's uh, sorry if it's disturbing you. Uh, okay, you're you're using the drift as a matrix to estimate the quality of uh, an estimator, and uh, I mean I don't know how uh, uh, rigorous it is. I mean, uh, uh, if uh, a state is not observable and you have less drift or more drift, does it uh, prove? that your uh, estimator has a higher quality and how you relate that to the uh, the way you're formulating the problem. Yes, uh, first of all, I, I thank you for all your feedback and uh, for what concerns the experiments. Of course, I had a lot of help from my colleagues. Thanks to them as well for helping me make all the experiments relating to the human and also the robot. And coming to your question, uh, I want to repeat the question here. You asked that I, I use the position drifts as a metric for comparison for uh, the estimators and how reasonable is this metric for comparison? So to answer this question, of course, I mean, the main metrics should be the observable directions, of course, for the comparison of the filters, but then uh, people working on control do not really enjoy watching uh, the estimator drift in position and also as an estimation guy it looks it looks really painful to see the position estimates drift so badly and here the main point is actually up i mean we are not using the position drifts as a metric but as a qualitative uh, 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 term i would say 
to imp try to improve the uh, filter because what I see here is uh, these sort of position drifts might come from, as I mentioned during the uh, presentation, might come from wrong choice of linearization points, especially when we're using uh, extended Kalman filtering where we depend on the linearization for propagating the error. And uh, particular, since we use IMU measurements, and if the linearization points are using the IMU measurements for uh, then any noise in the IMU measurements, especially uh, the accelerometer measurements, can induce uh, more trips. So the highlight here is to actually try to avoid uh, using wrong linearization points. That is the fact that I wanted to highlight. And uh, uh, this can be seen using the position drifts. Do I answer uh, your question? Mm -hmm. Uh, partially that I will answer. I will ask another another question that would maybe uh, uh, help you. Uh, I mean, I would ask, I would suggest, for example, so you're saying that uh, uh, the uh, EKF is failing because uh, the lane arise along the wrong uh, point. So do you can you imagine a way to show that like uh, by cheating and giving to EKF the correct linearization point and then linearizing around and showing uh, yeah. that the performances are uh, closer to uh, the invariant one? Yes, in fact, we did some experiments uh, on this, but uh, unfortunately I did not include them in the slides I, or I do not have them in the pass, uh, I mean the backup slides. But what we did was since we had the access to the Vicon measurements, we actually looked at this uh, problem uh, specifically because uh, of course since the uh, there are two issues here, drift in the positions and also uh, the uh, the growth of the covariance because this is an unobservable direction, right? So uh, we noticed that the uncertainty about the position direction was growing really bad. And of course, coming, talking, I mean, look, uh, passing, trying to pass absolute position measurements or trying to choose the linearization points uh, using the measurements, the Vicon measurements, it of course reduced the uh, position drifts. But uh, un, uh, I mean, I do not have a uh, graph, graph to show related mm -hmm. to this. I, I think that would be like an interesting material, like even in a publication, like to, to show theoretically. Yes, uh, I mean, it's, it's theoretical explanation that can be backed up with, uh, with a nice experiment. OK. And uh, this, I mean, the the quaternion based EKF that we propose, uh, we presented as a part of the literature, which is the OCEKF. Why it is called the OCEKF is it's because it's observable observability constrained EKF, yes. right? So they choose this linearization points by constraining the uh, observability matrix of the system to remain unobservable in the position directions. Because sometimes with the wrong choice of linearization points, they become uh, they uh, falsely become uh, overconfident in these directions because due to repeated measurements or due to noise in the actual uh, in the incoming measurements, and this might induce a divergence in the other estimates as well. So the, the observability constraint EKF is to along that direction. But uh, yes, uh, it, the, these kind of comparisons have been made. Uh, in detail in the SLAM community actually already mm -hmm. and in the past decade. Uh, and uh, we always keep inspiring us from the legged robots community. We inspire, get inspired from the techniques proposed in the SLAM community, right? So if we go back to the literature in SLAM community, they have done all sorts of uh, tricks and traits to have a really uh, good estimator design. But here, of course, we have our own challenges due to the contacts and uh, multi-body systems. Oh. Yeah, but for me it's a little bit different to be, uh, uh, but I think you agree that to, to be like constrained to be uh, observable and to know uh, like by uh, um, magic in, to know what is the correct linearization point because uh, yeah, whatever it's, it, but yeah, I think it, I, I would be really interested in to uh, seeing these kind of uh, investigations that you make. Okay. Uh, 
to continue a little bit about the evaluation of uh, the estimators, I, I want to ask more like this is this like an open discussion and your opinion about the fact that uh, precision is usually uh, the uh, the uh, golden metrics to be used for uh, uh, state observers. And we have uh, many papers that show the quality of, of state observation when compared with other observers. But uh, the uh, as you said uh, uh, also, the actual importance of, I mean, the actual use of observers is within a control loop and uh, precision is sometimes not the uh, the most critical part of control. Sometimes the dynamical uh, behavior of the uh, observer can be maybe too sensitive to vibrations that would be amplified somewhat by controllers. Uh, so have you had any kind of issues or discussions or uh, investigations around improving like the dynamical behavior in closed loop? Because that's little bit missing also in the in my opinion in the in, in this work is to show how it behaves with the uh, uh, closed loop so maybe i missed i, I missed something that uh, yes uh, was interesting mm -hmm. yes i i agree and i confess that that is one of the weaker points of this uh, thesis because uh, i do not show full closed loop uh, uh, results of these estimators and they remain fully open loop uh, but in general, what we noticed that was uh, while trying to close the loop with only legged odometry, uh, the, the, the problems for the controller are less affected by state estimation, I would say. This is what we understood when uh, we were trying to make uh, the robot walk in uh, torque control here with another uh, colleague uh, who is, whose PhD is on control of, uh, for walking. And uh, there, what we noticed was uh, the the estimates from legged odometry were already good enough for uh, uh, walking. Uh, but then, of course, uh, we did not we did not get uh, go to the corner cases where there will be uh, high, as I mentioned, really high norms in the uh, estimated velocities, which might occur with the legged odometry based approach. And this can cause the controller uh, to stop working. This we notice with uh, uh, torque control working when there are uh, noises in the joint velocities and we compute the uh, base velocity only relying on the kinematics and the controller stops working. But uh, yes. Uh, for what concerns the comparison of the estimators in this thesis uh, that is lacking that that should come as a future work and uh, I I can not already say uh, anything more about uh, the performances in closed loop but uh, with the performance in the open loop it can be inferred uh, that we can achieve a reliable feedback actually i believe so <laughs> I, it was uh, as i said it was more like an open question about uh, how to evaluate estimators when we don't we don't try them or we don't have that in, in mind but uh, for the case of walking you're, you're right actually most of the time very simple estimators are enough for walking but maybe when we try to do more dynamic things it's uh, it will be more critical so that the bottleneck is not exactly there, but I, I believe it's uh, this needs to be solved anyway. So, uh, uh, I, can I ask why you uh, you assume that's just like technical question? Why you assume uh, null foot velocities in in your model? Maybe I, it wasn't clear for me. Yeah, I, for that I was just uh, following the state of the art. Mm -hmm. So. I because it is a very common approach for legged robot estimation or also in the EKF based approaches to assume uh, uh, constant prediction models for the foot. And uh, I was just trying to replicate the state of the art in that direction. And of course, uh, since the measurements from the kinematics were continuously passed uh, as inputs to the EKF, we still had a, a good uh, tracking of the foot pose. But in general, I would say that uh, this also needs to be improved. The prediction model 
for the foot needs to be improved uh, during, during swing phase. And uh, in the swing phase, we really do not know what the foot is going to do, and we cannot really generalize towards um, a lot of motions. So the best bet would be to assume a constant uh, velocity or zero velocity model. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, I. I have a question that I, I don't know if you uh, had access to the report that I made or uh, I'm, I'm not yes. sure. Of course. Uh, OK, so th there was a question that was uh, uh, I, I reported there, so I, I, I guess you you prepared it a little bit. It's about the uh, uh, how you position yourself with the works that are taking different approaches. Uh, I gave the example, of course, uh, the thing that I know the best that uh, we published uh, in uh, uh, RAL about an estimator that uh, has uh, almost global convergence. Actually, it's based on an exponential global convergence, so uh, it's just details. And uh, it takes, it doesn't have more assumptions uh, that, I mean, it has the same assumptions that we have uh, contact on the ground. And uh, so, how do you position yourself with the works like that? Yes. Uh, so, uh, I will keep that uh, work that you proposed as a uh, centerpiece and uh, mm -hmm. focus matter, right? So what I see is that uh, this comes in, in with respect to the loosely coupled sensor fusion approaches that I proposed, uh, where the decoupling of the base orientation with the linear quantities can be exploited to use your work instead of relying on uh, some of the shelf observers. We can also use a different exponential, uh, different observer for the attitude orientation where uh, your work comes in exactly. Uh, and uh, it, it, it can be used as one of the sub block of the loosely coupled sensor fusion approach. That would be my answer. And uh, I do not, I did not, uh, uh, in comparison in the literature review that I performed for the thesis, what I did was to paint a big picture of all of the works done uh, in, not all of the works, most of the works done uh, in the humanoid robots community uh, in reference to what is done in the SLAM community. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. I uh, went into a deeper focus as towards the contribution. So this was my argument of uh, writing the literature review. And uh, yes, essentially your, uh, the work that uh, you mentioned comes in as a part of loosely coupled sensor fusion. Uh, okay, I, I mean, I uh, I would disagree with that, but uh, it, it's uh, so it, it's for me an example. But it's it's not a big case, first. Uh, it's uh, that's uh, no problem. Uh, the the for me it was just a question about. Uh, uh, so you have taken in this uh, in this thesis a path that is uh, of course is is probably the best. Uh, which is to take the like the state of the art and the mainstream uh, uh, solutions. Uh, so it the I was just asking like how do you consider like works that uh, go a little bit of the uh, these uh, these approaches. So this for example I gave this example because it's based on uh, uh, complementary filtering and uh, uh, so uh, do you consider that uh, they are. Uh, uh, outdated or no, no, there is uh, nothing to 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 see with them or uh, uh, like I, I, I what I see is that there is a, a big trend for uniformization in and that's not a bad thing but uh, it's, it's just uh, uh, an opinion that I'm, I'm asking yeah 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 definitely not I mean they are of course not outdated and uh, filtering uh, generally nonlinear observer design is more preferred uh, because they do not require any uh, explicit linearizations, right? So of course they are strong point of these approaches is that they do not need linearization. And instead, if we rely on uh, EKF based approaches or factor graph based approaches, we need explicit uh, uh, optimization based approach. We need explicit linearization. So uh, the uh, uh, nonlinear observers is, uh, it has this advantage but where the advantages of the filtering can be used is that uh, the uh, filters have adaptive uh, 
choice of canes, right? So this is mm -hmm. this theory can be mixed along with the uh, nonlinear observer design, uh, and I mean, of course, it, it the nonlinear observer design is a generalization of a Kalman filter, but instead it uses a fixed canes. It might use fixed canes instead of adaptive canes. Uh, so I would say it's not always the case, but uh, yeah, okay, I I, I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is, of course, it is not always the case. I also agree with mm -hmm. that. And uh, uh, and yes, uh, mostly for the nonlinear observer design, we rely mm -hmm. on uh, uh, orientation and velocity estimation. And if it is also extended towards the post estimation, then uh, they are really lightweight solutions uh, in comparison with uh, any other approaches. So. Of course, the road is, uh, there are multiple forks uh, in the road and we choose to go in one road and uh, also the literature is missing uh, an effective comparison between the factor graph based approaches, the EKF based approaches and the mm -hmm. non observer design. So this is a gap in the literature by itself. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, Yes, I mean, if I had enough time, I would have also tried to uh, uh, look to these differences. Actually, I was interested. I was starting mm -hmm. to look at the factor graph based approaches, actually, because it okay. seems to be mm -hmm. trend now. And uh, uh, yeah, if uh, the, the time was the problem. Yeah, so I can I, I can give you at least one drawback because I, I worked uh, I mean, uh, on having nonlinear observers it's uh, it's really really hard to have uh, proofs of convergence if you try to be uh, more like to get uh, to more complicated dynamics it's really really hard to scale up to to uh, uh, to uh, humanoid uh, uh, without the simplifications or without uh, sim uh, like uh, reduced models but uh, in some way, it's also the case with the uh, invariant Kalman filtering because that's that's actually what you met. At the end, you lost the invariance because uh, it's it's really easy to get out of the frame of uh, of uh, the uh, the conditions of uh, invariance, right? Can, can you repeat the last uh, sentence? So uh, I'm just saying that. Uh, in my opinion, one of the main drawbacks of nonlinear filtering is that it's hard to scale up to more complicated or more intricate uh, problems. But I believe that uh, this kind of issue is is also, uh, I mean, you already met them with invariant Kalman filtering because you lose at the end the invariance uh, when you modify your your model and when you have different. So, do you think there is uh, like uh, there is there is there is a way to keep these conditions forever or like uh, similarly you would have to I mean similarly to EKF you would have to at the end uh, get to uh, less uh, uh, how to say theoretically grounded solutions uh, okay I have just a minute just a few seconds <laughs> about it right so for me, what comes to my mind is uh, uh, some of the works that are being done by uh, Professor Robert Mahoney in Australia, where they try to handle all of these uh, uh, theoretical properties uh, for the nonlinear observer design. And uh, uh, but then they consider really small scale systems like uh, and scaling it up to humanoid robots. Uh, yes, I think. It, I mean, also since we uh, with the EKFs and any other uh, approaches, we rely on reduced models, and I'm really not sure how to answer this question. <laughs> Sorry, it's just it's, it's too open question. So it's fine. That was my last question anyway. I wanted to have like the the most of you. <laughs> uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you really for. Also. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. That's uh, that's all for me. Okay, great. So at this point, I think we can uh, move uh, to the next reviewer, uh, Jan Sola. Uh, 
Thank you very much once again. Thank you, Daniele. Um, thank you, Prashans, for, for this um, nice presentation. I enjoyed it a lot. Um, I, I like the way you, you deliver, the way you... I see you structure your thoughts very clearly, so you are able to, to you know, explain. I, I, I enjoyed very much this presentation. So thank you for that. Um, my contribution now or my intervention will be very much in line to what Medi did. Actually, uh, I enjoyed also your discussion here a minute ago. Um, and some of my questions are already covered by, by Medi. I uh, <clears throat> agree with um, uh, his congratulations to you for the amount of work uh, that you've done, um, the amount and the quality. Um, uh, touching so many points, uh, going into find what are the theoretical uh, nuances of each one of these points, and then doing so many um, practical demonstrations. Uh, it's really a, a, an enormous amount of work. Uh, we have uh, supervised several PhD already in similar topics, and we know how, how hard it is. So it's, it's really nice. Um, uh, regarding some questions that I may have, I, as I said, uh, some of the things that I was uh, concerned about, uh, you have already discussed with with Medi, but I have some other some other some other points, um, a bit out of order maybe about. Of, uh, so where should I start to make it? One of my main questions that you mentioned at the very end is. Um, uh, how do you position your your main um, uh, line of, of uh, designing the estimator uh, using filtering? And because you know I have been working a lot with factor graphs, and I wanted to know what was your your thought about this, because in the manuscript there is nearly no mention about about this other line of research. Um, I have advocated for this for years, but. It's not that I, I think that's the best. You know, you you take a decision, you you work for that, and for me it was very interesting to read your manuscript because I was getting answers to things that I thought uh, in the last years that I had no energy to test or to put into into question. So now maybe it's the time to 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 see um, to see what's what's the trade off between these two things. And uh, before you start answering, because there's so many things that you can go in this direction, um, uh, let me let me uh, put a few keywords. One would be uh, loosely coupled versus tightly coupled. When you mostly when you put a factor graph is because you are able to put everything there, so you are mostly inclined to go to some tightly coupled thing. Another question would be modularity. So how do you separate? different parts of the algorithm so that you don't have to design everything at once. So you can design pieces and then put them to work together. Um, so this seems easier with uncoupled uh, or loosely coupled systems. And and then uh, the invariance part, because for example, uh, factor graphs are solved with uh, nonlinear optimization. So you can linearize iteratively. You can remove outliers uh, later, so your linearizations are not uh, bounding for for the future, and 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 then the invariant part of the of the filtering approaches that I believe you can also use when you build factor graphs, but I never explored this. My belief is just the way you design your errors and so on. So uh, this is a big question. Uh, just. Uh, just what are you thinking about about this about this <laughs> this amalgam of, of things? Okay. Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you for your feedback and also your questions. So, coming to your uh, very long questions, I will try to recollect uh, things now. So, uh, first of all, factor graph comparing a factor graph based approach with uh, the Kalman filter. Here we are really actually uh, questioning about the no underlying nonlinear optimization, comparison of underlying nonlinear optimization with the Kalman filter. Because with factor graph, can we can also build a Kalman filter. Right? 
So <laughs> just to clear things uh, out. So here the question is the comparison of smoothing based approaches or nonlinear optimization with filtering based approaches. And uh, uh, my argument is uh, for kinematic inertial odometry, it uh, both of them uh, be on level ground. Only when we uh, try to include uh, perception algorithms and uh, more advanced uh, uh, estimation like the centroidal state estimation, if we want to couple uh, the centroidal state estimation with the base state estimation in that sense, a factor graph can have an higher ground because of the way you combine uh, each of the factors within the same optimization problem. Although it can be computationally expensive, uh, it can still, I, I believe, I mean, I'm not, uh, we started working, but I did not achieve uh, uh, any results related to the factor graph, but I believe it has a good potential. But uh, essentially what we define as uh, uh, errors in the filter become factors in the factor graph, right? So uh, in terms of modularity, I would say, uh, Yes, considering also from the implementation point of view, it is more challenging to uh, consider modularity within an EKF based approach. But the loosely coupled sensor fusion approach can uh, be uh, can be advantageous in that sense in terms of modularity. But when we bring factor graph into the picture, of course, it uh, provides much more modularity with the with the language that it introduces the factors and uh, uh, you really only need to care about the optimization problem in the end. And if you want to bring different measurement models, you only need to think which measurements relate to which states in your quantity, uh, which of course, essentially you do it also in uh, the EKF based approach. Uh, but there you have a much more uh, full round, all round representation of uh, the problem in hand. So. Uh, I would say for kinematic inertial odometry, I think it's uh, all right. It's okay to still work with uh, uh, such tightly coupled uh, EKF approaches or lo even loosely coupled EKF approaches. Uh, and uh, I, so I answered modularity and I, I I forgot the other questions, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, you answered a lot. Uh, maybe the one that I also mentioned was the, uh, considering the invariant errors. Ah, yes. And, yeah. and so, because um, uh, EKF and similar systems, you just linearize once, and then, and then if this Jacobian is not the one that you wanted, then you become a little bit inconsistent and with time things uh, diverge and it don't, doesn't work. But with the introduction of the invariant errors, this problem might be uh, very much diminished or even eliminated. Uh, but myself, I haven't uh, designed um, estimators with this concept of invariance in hand, so I, I more or less can see what what this is about, but I don't have the you know the, the feeling since you have done it uh, because I solve this by linearizing multiple times and then I convert to something that uh, it's probably good enough. Okay, but I I would like to know what is the um, the feeling that you get from this invariance part in the sense that uh, maybe if your Jacobians are good for life then you don't need an iterative system and then you can you know think about uh, as you said uh, you can build a factor graph and solve it with an with an ekf by just by just doing one update so this this line of of, of thinking maybe maybe i would like to know your your opinion here yes uh, i think you you answered the question already <laughs> <laughs> because <laughs> i have I do not see much to answer here. So, <laughs> of course, when with the invariant EKF, the advantage is, of course, uh, uh, the Jacobians become state dependent. But, but uh, and if this, this is, of course, uh, and again in the factor graph, we take the Jacobians again. Uh, 
so in the factor graphs, uh, I would say also in the linearization, we can uh, add the, I mean, to add, I, I only add points to the factor graph based approaches here. Uh, okay, no, I, I'm sorry. Let me retrace a little bit because I was thinking on along a different line. Uh, so, comparing the, I mean, I believe that you answered the question. So, I, I, I think I do not have something more to add on this. So, and I, I, I believe we will really understand only when we compare it with experimental performances. Yeah, maybe that means that we agree on this, this, this kind of nuances. Yeah. In, in fact, uh, there has been recent approaches where they use this invariant uh, uh, invariant uh, error uh, techniques to propose uh, smoothing methods, which are called invariant uh, pixel lag smoothers, and they apply it for uh, uh, visual inertial odometry. So, of course, there is research towards that direction as well. And uh, yes, I agree on the point that uh, it depends on the computational budget you have and uh, the amount of uh, ex performance that you derive from the experiments or application in hand. That is the only difference that you can get by uh, in terms of uh, exploiting the invariance properties. But it, it, it is a good language to think for designing estimators. So that is my selling point here <laughs> to design consistent estimators. Regarding invariance, as I said, I am not very uh, skilled on this, but uh, there was this comment by Meli that at one point you break or you lose or you are no longer able to apply invariance all over the place. I completely missed this point. So wh where is this happening and why? Okay, uh, for the when when we use IMU biases within the system dynamics for the assumed uh, uh, model uh, using the strap down inertial model, right? If we use the IMU dynamics, then the uh, system dynamics is not group affine anymore, as I mentioned, the group affine property. So there uh, you do not, uh, the linearization becomes dependent on the uh, bias. So okay. you lose the invariance there. Okay, okay. okay. <clears throat> Um, what else? Yes, a, a question that I think it's important for me to understand one of your choices. In chapter two, you apply uh, metrically groups to the state, which is, uh, let's say, quite common uh, in the last times, but also to the measurements. So, um, okay, why not? Uh, good. But uh, my question would be, why in the sense that which part of the measurement is a non-vector and why cannot you use a vector representation of this part of the measure? So what do you get uh, as a benefit in, in considering also that you have to pay the price to develop new equations and as the way you put those equations, they are also probably harder to compute by the computer at the, at the very end. So what would be the trade-off? What do you really uh, win and, and is it really necessary? Okay. Yes, that that question I try to ask myself every day is it really necessary to have the representation of uh, observations in matrix D groups? So here uh, the problem really comes with the rotation matrix in the post, right? And uh, there are different choices for the representation of post. We all, uh, most of us know that. So. Uh, one of the state of the art actually tackles this problem by uh, considering only two axes of orientation. And they say, okay, with this two axes, I have the information about the full orientation. So they still go for vector observations. They do not go for matrix leaf group observations. And uh, that is the filter that we showed as invariant EKF for the flat foot, invariant EKFF, right? And uh, I came across this implementation only very recently, so uh, I was I was uh, curious. I mean, uh, evaluating the performance, both of them performed really uh, similar, 
So the ve using vector observations has a clear advantage, but then uh, again, uh, it's like if you have a rotation, expressing it as a rotation might seem much more. Uh, uh, I would use the word elegant here, but of course, it hurts the uh, it hurts the implementation uh, factor, the computational from the computational point of view. But uh, since it is a really proper representation, I would advocate for uh, going for uh, observations on matrix Lie groups. And further, if we can somehow formulate these matrix Lie group observations as also invariant observations for which uh, there is there has been recent research, then we have a really generalized filter uh, for uh, these kind of complex quantities such as forces and rotations. So this will be my argument. So having a general filter. Yeah, that's that, that's that enjoys the property of invariant filtering. That's good per se, yes, yes. Um, uh, my very little question now is uh, where this, where is this uh, orientation measurement come from? It's from the motion capture system or because this, usually, usually sensors are physical devices that measure scalar quantities that then you organize in a vector. So each sensor is one scalar. So you never have rotations rotation matrices or quaternions inside measurements only if there is some software computing things and giving you measurements like I don't know uh, double antenna GPS gives you orientation okay uh, and then the motion capture but other than this uh, what would be a measurement that you need to introduce to the Kalman filter in the, in this in this uh, Lie theoretic form so it is basically the relative kinematics. It is obtained from the relative kinematics. We start from the encoder measurements that gives ah, the joint, okay. joint angles. And then since it is a serial chain of the leg from the base to the leg, we compute the relative forward kinematics from the base to the foot. And in the end, we end up with the transformation matrix from which we get the rotation. So also it's, it is challenging I mean, I have not accounted for noises explicitly uh, uh, how the noises translate to force errors the, and how they accumulate to force errors. I only uh, use the exponential map directly, but uh, in this case, it could also be meaningful to try to understand how, uh, since this is a kinematic chain, how the uh, force errors at the end effector are accumulated because at each time we compute uh, the uh, a relative force through a matrix multiplication. So, okay. Yes. W would it be possible in this case, because it seems that you're propagating from the ground up some, some phenomena and compute a measurement at the base level, okay, which is a rotation matrix, okay. How would it be, how could you do the opposite, like uh, propagate the states down to the ground and then make apply the measurement down there? Is it equivalent or or because we do the opposite? We you know we do the direct kinematics down to the foot and then and then put the measurement there. Yeah, I mean I think it should not uh, differ because in the end we are just formulating a measurement model that are function of the states and then. It just becomes a matrix inversion in the end, like the inverse, uh, and maybe the signs in the resulting Jacobians might change, and the order of multiplications might change. So, uh, in the end, it should not uh, it should not uh, affect significantly. Also, otherwise, we can also take another approach where instead of expressing it, no, sorry, I I, I will stop with that answer. Okay, um, I'm nearly done. Let me see if I have another thing. Uh, I had a question. Well, it's it's maybe very simple this one, but why not? So you have this this um, contact, or the foot contact, that you allow it to rotate a little bit uh, according to friction, and then that this is quite clever. You 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 see where the center of pressure is and then 
that point would be a um, rotation axis, no? How, how good is this model in, in reality? So uh, uh, compared to, you know, you just rotate according to the center of the foot or whatever. So if you compute this rotation point, is really the rotation happening at this point? Or I, I guess if the friction is not uniform, this is not true. So how good in reality this, this model uh, performs in your experience? Okay, uh, uh, I mean, we do not exploit explicitly this foot rotation. Uh, it's not explicit. And uh, uh, just to clarify, we also do not explicitly enforce fix friction constraints. We only get the information from the center of pressure uh, uh, to compute uh, some contact forces at the vertices. And then we use this information in our uh, approaches. And uh, uh, in terms of, okay, uh, I, I have not done an explicit comparison because uh, what I what we did was initially we only used one contact wrench and uh, we infer the contact using this contact wrench and uh, this uh, while incorporating uh, information about uh, in, in only this information what happened was uh, even with legged odometry sometimes what happens is it starts walking uh, uh, in a staircase it, the position starts drifting uh, uh, faster uh, but in this case uh, we choose the contact points and we explicitly enforce the uh, height of these contact points, right? And uh, this allows us uh, to reduce the position errors, but uh, in terms of uh, foot rotations, what we do is we only sh show an improvement in the uh, resulting velocity estimates because since we do not use a zero velocity assumption of the fixed foot, which might be rotating, uh, uh, and we only in include it in the velocity averaging part for, for what concerns the loosely coupled the sensor fusion approach. So uh, it, we see an uh, improvement uh, in the velocity estimation, at least in terms of uh, maximum errors. But uh, in general, uh, uh, in general, uh, for full fledged walking experiments or something like that. Uh, I have not done a detailed uh, analysis. OK. OK, present. I think I think I will stop here. But this could go on for, for a long time. <laughs> so thank you very much. Congratulations. And, and thank yeah, thank you. Thank you a lot. OK, I think that now we move to the last examiner. Uh, uh, Dr. Olivier Stas, uh, Olivier. Yeah, I'm, I'm back. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, uh, Prashan, for the uh, for the nice uh, presentation and also for the for the for the manuscript. I, I really uh, also would like to join. Uh, Mehdi and, and Joanne uh, on this. Uh, it's very interesting. So as, as they are the expert, much more expert than me on, <laughs> on the nonlinear filtering and, and, um, and SLAM, I will, uh, I will ask a complementary and, and more maybe application focused uh, question. Um, so what I wanted to know is um, what, so according to maybe, so I've seen that you, you apply some of your, uh, 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 filter uh, to working. Uh, I know that you partially answer this to uh, to John uh, just now, but um, one, one something which is very difficult for us right now are flexibilities. And um, in in our robot, actually, we we have one flexibility which is uh, not observ directly observable. Uh, and this is not obviously uh, difficult. <laughs> Uh, and I would like to have uh, from you um, a quick feedback on, on in regarding the kinematic information that you are using. Uh, how basically did you manage to um, reflect in the noise or in your in your scheme uh, the uncertainty um, related to this kind of factor into your system? Yes. 
thank you thank you for the feedback first of all and uh, thank you for the question uh, so yes to answer this question what we do is uh, we uh, start from the encoder noise we assume a noise on the encoder and then uh, we just use the uh, jacobian the manipulator jacobian uh, to reflect the noise on the encoders onto the pose so uh, if that that is the answer to the question. So, yeah, but actually, this is um, so the um, actually what I usually know is that uh, you have a kind of uh, um, you know uh, a scalability issue between the fact that you have to, to some extent reflect the kinematic error and the one from your uh, IMU sensor. And uh, something I found very interesting in your manuscript is that you you have um, an accelerometer, uh, I, I assume, uh, an IMU inside the feet, which gives you additional information that there are very few uh, human and robot equipped with such uh, such uh, information. So more precisely, is that how did you um, manage to um, to get the scaling between all this information, which are of different uh, different nature? I mean, the, I think the encoder are quite precise. I would say that everything which is not precise may come from physical effect that you, you don't have uh, maybe direct um, measurement on top of it. So I was asking, so how, so actually for us, um, what came out is to have an indirect measurement of the flexibility of the system. But after spending a lot of time <laughs> In making sure that we had the accurate measurements in the forces, accurate measurements on the IMU. So I wanted to know if you developed some kind of methodology regarding this, this scaling specifically. Oh, I would say uh, no, actually, because uh, as I mentioned earlier, we uh, we I simply consider uh, propagating only the encoder noises and to scale uh, it along with the uh, measurements coming from the IMU and uh, other sources. Uh, we just uh, uh, do a variance analysis for these different measurements. For example, an IMU, there is the known approach known as Allen variance, where you can actually get different noise parameters for the IMU. So I started from there uh, for the for what concerns the IMU and for encoder uh, for the kinematics. We only consider encoder noises. And uh, in general, yes, I found it also interesting that, as I already answered, uh, Joan, uh, Dr. Joan Sola, that uh, uh, considering the proper propagation of noise through the kinematic structure that will account for all the uh, unmodeled uh, nonlinearities that you mentioned uh, is uh, will be quite interesting. And uh, if, if this is particularly interesting, if uh, also since uh, we can model the kinematic chain as a product of exponentials and we can project the noises from each of these nonlinearities onto the rigid body uh, onto how it affects the rigid body and uh, project it to the end effector towards this uh, uh, along this serial uh, kinematic chain so uh, but we do not consider that explicitly but it could be an interesting uh, research uh, from a research point of view, interesting thing to analyze. OK, OK, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so I, I guess just just to make sure um, we agree that in terms of uh, kinematics, uh, you may um, so you, the relationship between your, for example, your IMU and the kinematics, you read it with the Jacobian of the of the system. Uh, so I don't know if it, it really happens, but it occurs to me that maybe you 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 could lose observability through the, the kinematics that that it happens to for you, or you never had such a case. There is a more rare case where the Jacobians. So you know, for example, when the um, when we started to 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 go over obstacles, uh, that you have uh, you run into singularities because you have an alignment with the ankle and the um, and the uh, and the hip, uh, which is very unfortunate. <laughs> so uh, I was wondering if you manage this explicitly or it just you didn't never run into this kind of problem. We never run into this uh, problem actually. Or at least uh, I have missed it in my 
uh, analysis, but uh, generally uh, I did not go through this uh, question. But uh, I, I understand that at some points uh, uh, it also affects with just the measurements coming from the uh, IMU and the kinematics. The uh, there are there might be some configurations on the robot where uh, the given measurements might not fully excite the system, which might induce some unobservable directions within the state within the uh, filter. And uh, I only know this from a theoretical point of view, and uh, uh, I haven't done any further analysis or from a practical perspective, we never faced this issue. OK, OK, yeah, I, th I think for walking, it never occurred to me. Uh, it's just when you start to do a bit of much more weird motion that the one that Mehdi was talking about, when you start to do something a bit more uh, dynamics or with more complex terrain that this occurs rarely, but uh, it happens. OK, thank you very much for this answer. Um, uh, no, it's much more um, for um, uh, use of what you the method that you, you proposed. Uh, so, for instance, I was very much interested in your um, in your chapter uh, related to the uh, <coughs> estimation of uh, human motion. Uh, and so, for example, the contact uh, detection, I think it, it's very interesting. But the point is that it's uh, very interesting specifically for humanoids. Uh, I think this is a trickiest part <laughs> is contact switching where you can start to have a very transient, uh, complex effect with a high frequency, such as, for example, something which happened very uh, very often to us. I don't know if you have on ICUP, but I believe maybe this is the case, is a, a rebound effect, where basically your, <clears throat> your robot is coming too early on the ground, you hit it, then the system rebound, and you can see there is strong oscillation on the force sensor. Uh, I think on, on, on three humanities, I, I've always have the same kind of effect. And, and your center of pressure uh, detection could be extremely uh, useful. And what happens is very often, if your control law is too aggressive and you react too quickly to this kind of, uh, of effect, you may uh, counteract something that you, that you, you, you don't know. And uh, my question will be, um, again, you know, it's, it's slightly related to, um, the trust you put in the kinematics. <laughs> you can see that again, if you have flexibility, then then you're gonna hit the ground uh, more quickly. So could you could you um, uh, imagine or tell us how do you think that your uh, your estimator re would react in such kind of, of case uh, in this kind of unforeseen event where the um, it will be important for us to uh, to detect this uh, this kind of motion? Yes. Thank you for the question. First of all, I would like to give uh, credits for the uh, center of pressure based contact detection to one of my colleagues, Stefano Dapara. I built upon his work because he proposed it was his contribution for his PhD thesis that we can decompose the contact wrench into uh, normal forces depending on the center of pressure. And then I just used that for uh, the contact detection. And now to answer your question, uh, yes. Uh, we do have those jumpy effects sometimes as a robot walks. It is rare, but we have that effects. But fortunately, I have not used them uh, for my experiments in the estimation. But to for, by forecasting uh, what what I uh, observed with this estimation, uh, uh, we use a Schmidt trigger based thresholding for these kind of problems. So these jumpy effects can uh, this Schmidt trigger uh, based thresholding is simple, but yet it uses a timing parameter to actually switch uh, the state uh, from uh, uh, it checks if the rising signal is rising until some uh, high point or uh, and then only switches. So this uh, this mid trigger based thresholding can already prevent some points of uh, improper contact uh, uh, inference during when the robot is jumping. So we can try to smooth out the effects of these jumps. But however, uh, uh, this is not enough relying only on the uh, dynamic quantities, maybe also including uh, uh, velocities, but 
trying to estimate the velocities at these points and using them in uh, together with the dynamic uh, forces and further also using a, uh, a terrain height updates can improve the contact detection much better and contact detection is very crucial for uh, uh, the state estimation because it the as we saw, saw uh, in the plots that i showed the position drifts mainly occur to due to improper contact detection so uh, yes i mean the proposed approach i, I see uh, could do good but it can be improved using velocity and uh, position estimates as well okay uh, thank you very much so maybe um uh a last question <laughs> on this field so i i think you that was interesting you are speaking about Riemannian distance and maybe a kind of uh, follow-up on uh, what uh, Joan and, and Ben Alang uh, and Mehdi uh, propose um, discuss about is, uh, you know, that those people are more, uh, at least in the same community, uh, proposing to have this kind of uh, smoothing, what I see has a kind of nonlinear optimization. And I believe that uh, putting this in the proper manifold is a, is a good way of, of solving the, the matter. So do you think it will be interesting to have um, a, a, a to, to, to continue into the direction that you have uh, proposed, but using optimization, uh, solving Riemannian metrics, you think that it's, it's feasible in your uh, in your system, in, in your point of view, or is it too complex? Uh, uh, to be honest, I've seen some complex. So the the, the people using GTSAM or Wolf, we have spent a large amount of years <laughs> trying to develop this general system and and. I feel that they are still quite complex to um, to master and to develop, uh, and and I would like to have maybe uh, again the same uh, line that uh, Mehdi and, and Joan ask if if you think it's worthwhile or if somebody who is entering the field uh, is maybe uh, much more wiser to to switch to nonlinear filter, simple one to to implement, and it's going to be good enough for for what we want to do. Okay. Uh, so, uh, considering uh, the uh, okay, uh, I'm, uh, could you repeat the portion uh, re related to the Riemannian distance that you discuss? Uh, yeah. So the, the the point is that there is a tendency. I, I will sorry. I will try to rephrase and maybe um, uh, precise a bit more my question. Um, so basically, uh, what happened is that so we have those um, uh, Markov blankets which relate sensor, control, dynamical system together. And what's happening is that we we understand, I think, better. So uh, it, it was understood by Kalman uh, decades ago, but I think now we have the computational power to implement it. Is that we can extract a lot of uh, optimization prompts, which are different question based on this model which are for instance um if you do estimation uh, will be uh, what are the, uh, the 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 best trajectory of my system which explain all the measurements that i have done before or the other question will be okay what are the uh, position of the points that i have seen inside the environment uh, which will be uh, best explain the observation and the control load that i've been uh, doing and from the control viewpoint uh, based on this observation that you have made, based on the best estimation, what will be the best uh, control that you want to uh, to do uh, in order to perform um, some task? So we, we have this same model that we can use in different contexts, which are, in your case, state estimation, but could be also the same as the control. Mm -hmm. So we have this kind of uniform viewpoint uh, which seems to go, and I've seen the same in control, uh, using now manifold Riemannian metrics in, in the hope that we have this grand <laughs> theory <laughs> which will help us to solve different kind of problems, but with a unified point of view of several problems. My, my, my question, which is maybe practical, is that um, so I think uh, Joanne has trying to do that from the estimation viewpoint, uh, building a wolf. Uh, somehow Frank Delert is also making papers which are either estimation, either control law, 
And again, this is a multiple view of the same prems. What it seems to be is that it's, it's pretty complex to build up, to, to build upon. It's, uh, so you need the proper tools to simplify. And I think your work and the, in, the, in the PhD seems to say that now we, it's better understood. We have the, the mathematical tools. We know how to write it. Now the question comes, are we able to, to come up with technical tools implementing those questions? OK. Mm -hmm. And um, I would like to have your feedback <laughs> of somebody sp spending three years trying to solve this kind of unified view <laughs> with these tools. Is that if we, um, if you think there are some tools which are ready on uh, to be used and, and solving this big question, or is it still worth it? I think, and again, I think I'm just in the line of what uh, Joan and uh, Mehdi uh, asked before, um, that it, it's Yes. We don't have any tools yet ready to, to answer this question, or it's better to, to go and to resort to some simple implementation. And yes. that will be my final question. Yes, definitely. Very interesting question indeed. So I will, I, I mean, uh, uh, so to, from both the control and estimation point of view, I would say that, I mean, the, the end goal is, I mean, we basically define an error and then we solve either a filtering problem or an optimization problem. And the choice of error, of course, depends on uh, if you're going to use the Lie group or if you're going to use a vector uh, space, which are much easier to implement and uh, uh, also technically easier to deal with. So regarding this, uh, what I believe is, for example, in that direction, uh, I would say MANIF, that is of course uh, Joan Solas uh, and uh, uh, work with uh, Jeremy Dere, I believe, uh, his name if I pronounce correctly. So it already moves in that direction where uh, you all have all the representations implemented as uh, C in a C++ framework uh, providing libraries. And in the end, what even if we consider the optimization problems in we fall back to very similar structures, right? We want to either solve a nonlinear least square or uh, 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 a quadratic program, which is again so, so similar to the least square problem, but containing constraints. Uh, how we scale this on, now we are very comfortable by, uh, to solve these uh, in the vector spaces uh, using libraries uh, that are uh, available like uh, OSQP, for example, and things like that. To expand it to matrix Lie groups, we all, we need to uh, understand only very basic operations that might replace the uh, uh, the operations that are happening on uh, the vector spaces, of course. Uh, so building a technical framework uh, that generalizes or unifies uh, all of these together using the theory of Lie groups, I would, I mean, since I've crossed the river, I would say that it will not be very challenging because of the generalized concepts, uh, but of course, trying to have a really performant uh, framework using these, uh, uh, using these tools, that will be challenging and also to, uh, plug in to have a plug and play system of trying to test different optimization algorithms trying to account for different constraints that is uh, that is going to be uh, that will be a bit more challenging i would say but uh, but i i believe that it is not uh, far and uh, i i, I uh, for example uh, there are libraries like Cheras that already handle the optimization problems accounting for uh, the implementations in the matrix Lie groups. So we can also uh, maybe modify that to be used also for the control frameworks by redefining the errors with respect to the control uh, vector instead of the measurements. I am not sure if I uh, clearly answered your question. If not, I will. We can reiterate on that if you. It was also a very open question, so th thank you very much for your for your answer. Thanks. Thank you. And I'm done.
uh, yeah, I don't know if uh, there is uh, any other answer. Uh, sorry, questions in the case of our questions and answers. I, I would like to add, add a comment, Daniel, if it's possible, yeah. uh, according to this last topic. Um, uh, that maybe it's obvious, but um, uh, control and estimation are dual problems. So they can be solved with the same tools because mathematically they are exactly the same problem. So uh, in the large sense, this last question by Olivier is yes, we just need the libraries that are gener generic enough to be able to simplify things. And some of these libraries are not yet there. For example, the, the way Ceres is handling manifolds is a bit weird. It's not exactly what we want. It's there, but it's not there at the same time and things like that. And then if some big library with, with a big support behind is not doing the full work, then a lot of people are lagging behind because, uh, for example, building an equivalent to Ceres, it's a lot of work. And it's not yet ready for the manifold thing in the way that, for example, I would like to, to have it. So it's not 100% compatible with Manif, for example, for details that are not the case. But in, in generally speaking, these two problems are dual. And so the mathematics for one problem serve exactly for the other problem. This is last comment. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much once again, Jon, uh, and also uh, all the jury members. So uh, right now, uh, at this point, uh, we, the jury members and advisors uh, uh, will disconnect from this call. And you should have received uh, uh, an email uh, with uh, with the link of a new uh, a new think room where we uh, basically connect and we discuss about the overall results and performances of Mr. Prashant Ramados. Uh, may you just confirm uh, that you received the link? Okay, great. So at this point. Uh, uh, I would ask uh, uh, Mr. Prashant Ramados to leave the physical room where we are, because we are physically in the same room. And uh, then, but uh, 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 please uh, check out the, the things, because once we uh, are about to restart, then we will uh, probably will communicate. All right. Uh, I also stop the recording.